If you've got your Bibles with you, will you turn to First Chronicles? First Chronicles chapter 11. For we're just going to read uh, one verse. And uh, it's the story of Benaiah. I've been threatening to preach this. And during the week I thought, you know what, we'll go for it this morning. A man who slew a lamb in a pit on a snowy day. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, a valiant man. The man who slew a lamb in a pit on a snowy day. And I've got to begin by giving thanks to the man who I heard preach this, Pastor McGee. He preached it down in Whitewell, oh, 20 years ago, I'm sure. Sitting, uh, he was ill at the time, and he sat at the pulpit. He couldn't even stand there. And when he brought this, and what a blessing it was. And I've always remembered it, and it's a wonderful story. The man who slew a lamb in a pit on a snowy day. May the Lord bless this to all of our hearts. Verse 22. It says, Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant fal- man of Kabzil, who had done many acts. He slew two land-like men of Moab. Also, he went down and slew a lion in a pit on a snowy day. Powerful, isn't it? The man who slew the lion in a pit on a snowy day. Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning that we were able to give that report. Josie's mother coming to faith and being saved. For Junior's father, we thank you, Lord, that He has come to you. Will you keep your hand on the two of them this morning? We'll pray for Liz this morning. A backslider that you'll bring her back. Glorify your lovely name. We remember that big lad who juked his head in, Father, this morning. James, I told him I would pray for him, and I'm doing it right now. Pray that you'll bring him down, that you'll save him, and you'll change his life. Glorify your name. In Jesus' name we ask. Everybody said... Benaiah, the man who slew a lion in a pit on a snowy day. His name, Benaiah, it represents every single one of you that are looking at me this morning who have received the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. Those of you who are born again of the Spirit of God. He represents the child of God whom God is developing and growing and ministering to. Benaiah represents every child of God. His name is a Hebrew name meaning Ready for this? God builds. People with this name, and it's a privilege to have this name, and to represent this name, people with this name tend to be orderly and dedicated to building their lives on a solid foundation of order and service. Jesus in Matthew 16 and 18 says, if you remember, I will build. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevent, shall not prevail against it. In Ephesians 1 and 23, and in Colossians 1.18, will tell you that 
the church which is his body, i.e. you and me who are born again into the body of Christ. We are his workmanship. We are his lively stones being built up a spiritual a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. In other words, the name Benaiah represents every child of God that is growing in the body of Christ. His name from the Hebrew, the meaning is Yahweh or Jehovah has built or is building. Benaiah, as I say, represents every child of God that he, that is God, is building into a work for himself. Ephesians 2, 8 and 10 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Listen to this, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. 1 Peter 2 and 5 says, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house. And in the Amplified Bible it reads like this, Come and like living stones be yourselves built into a spiritual house for a holy, dedicated, consecrated priesthood to offer up those spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable and pleasing to God. That was a mouthful, and everybody said. Benaiah, the name Benaiah represents every child of God. In this reading, this short reading, you will see that Benaiah had an adversary. He had an enemy or an adversary and it was a lion. <laughs> and I want you to think for a minute. He's representing the child of God who is getting built up. A work of God. And he has an adversary. And it's a lion. For some people, when they get saved, I think, that's me saved and safe and nothing will ever harm or hurt me. And I will just walk through life like skipping through the daisies. And then at the end, I will rise and go to be with my Lord forever. Eh -eh. <laughs> Wrong. Benaiah the man... The woman who God is building, who God is growing, who God is feeding, who God is changing, has also an adversary. Our adversary this morning is threefold. Are you ready for this? Your adversary is threefold. Number one, the world. Number two, the flesh. And number three, the devil. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15, it says, listen to this, child of God, love not the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. 
If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now let me stress this. There's nothing wrong with wanting certain things that the world has to offer, like a beautiful home, for instance. In fact, God takes houses and makes them into homes. Did you know that? Nothing wrong with wanting a a beautiful house, a beautiful home, a lovely car, lovely holidays, the Tenerife and the Fala Cortes. half bored if you can afford it. Hallelujah. Nothing wrong with those things. Nothing wrong with having money. But pastor, the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Aye, the love of it. You can have money and not love it. Did you know that? And in fact, I pray that you would prosper as your souls would prosper when it comes to money, every one of you. I pray for my family, every one of them, that God will bless their businesses and that someday they will take off and that they have healthy businesses, providing those businesses and that money doesn't have them. There's a big difference. And so this is what it means when it says, love not the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And then he says, if Any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And there's a tremendous example to be found of someone who loved the world. Within the word of God. Does anybody know his name? It's Demas. And you'll hear about Demas over in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. And can I say this, unfortunately... I don't know what percentage it is, but it's a large percentage of God's people who have fallen into this trap. The lights of the world, and by the way, everything that glitters isn't gold, the lights of the world calls to them. I know people who have been saved for many years, love the Lord, going on well, doing things for God on and on, and then they take maybe a lazy fit. And all of a sudden, it's like the world begins to call them. And they start entertaining all these thoughts of going back out into the world. They remember all the good times that they had before they got saved. The devil whispers in their ear, do you remember the night you had with all the boys? Do you remember standing up in Dunmore Park Stadium in your Greyhound one? And you were going home with a big fistful of money. Doesn't it remind you of the nights that you were driving, or you were walking home and they were driving the Greyhounds home in taxis and they were looking out the window at you? The dogs were getting a taxi home and I was walking it. Forget about these things. But all of a sudden they begin to call you. Do you ever hear those things? Resist the devil and he will flee. Temptation. Somebody says, I can stick anything past their butt. Temptation. You've got to be an overcomer. So it says that in 2 Timothy 4.10, Luke says, Demas has forsaken me. He didn't say Demas has forsaken the church. He says, Demas, Demas has forsaken me. Can I say this, brother and and, and sister? It's not to hurt you. You see, when you do these things, you're hurting your brother and your sister. Did you know that? You see, you just being there, going on with God, you're blessing your brother and blessing your sister. And you may be going through hell upon earth, it feels, resisting the temptation that's in front of you. But continue to resist. You're not on your own because the brother beside you, behind you, in front of you, at the side of you, is going through the same thing. So is that, sister. You're not on your own temptation. If the devil came and tempted the Lord three times, he's going to tempt you. With the, with the, the glittering lights of the world, Demas, he says, has forsaken me. Watch this. Having loved this present world, and has departed onto 
Ibiza, Las Vegas, or as he called it, Thessalonica. And in Thessalonica, it was like Vegas, it was like Ibiza, where all the young ones flocked to, and I can tell you, I've spoke to many who went to the, 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 the both places and wished that God had never have went. So he says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If you love the world, he says, the love of the Father is not in you. What do you love most? Second, if you'll turn to Galatians chapter 5. Oh, this is powerful, this reading. This is powerful. The first of the trinity of your adversary is the world. Second is the flesh. And before I say anything, can I say this? The flesh of a born again child of God is no different from the flesh of an unsaved man. Flesh is flesh. Everybody said. Some people think when you, you get saved, then them desires for the flesh go away. No, no, no. In fact, they're ready for this. They can intensify. Because you always want what you can't have. What you're not allowed. And so, brothers and sisters, we have got to learn to overcome the flesh. Or, as the Bible puts it, to crucify the flesh. Now watch this. It's a powerful reading. Galatians 5, verse 16. Paul says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Boy, how dare you feel that atmosphere. Walk in the Spirit, and by the way, there's your answer. We don't have to get to the end of a three-point sermon here. There's your answer. Walk in the Spirit. <laughs> if you walk in the Spirit, if you walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Watch this. For the flesh, this is your adversary, church. I don't be looking over your shoulder at anybody. <laughs> We're looking around at anybody else. This is your flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Paul over in Romans, he talks about the things that he should do and the things that he shouldn't do. And he says, every time I go to do the things that I should do, I end up doing the things I shouldn't do. And vice versa. And then he cries out, oh wretched man that I am. He sees the flesh. He feels the flesh. He feels, he feels the lust of the flesh. That doesn't mean necessarily that that's the sexual lust, by the way. He feels it. Many of God's people feel it. He says, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. In other words, the things that you want to do. If I say to many, you just want to be right before God, walk right before God. Have a walk, be shine and be a light, be an example. Everybody, yes, pastor, I do. But then you would say, but pastor, I get it. So does Paul. That battle that goes on, the spirit against the flesh, the flesh against the spirit, like cat and dog, two different natures. By the way, the one that you feed the most is going to come out on top. Selah. And that's why it says that if you walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill 
the lust of the flesh. He gives you the answer, the antidote, before he even gives you the, the problem. Then he says, but, watch this, but if you be led off the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh, he is ready for this. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. In other words, the flesh will manifest like this. You will see the lust of the flesh. Hi, watch. Now the works of the flesh are manifest or produced or shown forth. Which are these? You're ready for this. And it's incredible this. It's the first one in the list. Adultery. I want to show you in one wee second why sometimes I lost the plot up here when I'm trying to get through to people to live right before God. Watch this. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Adultery. Fornication uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders. These are all in the same list. Drunkenness. You see, this is where you hear people, oh, well, I don't do what he does and I don't do what she does. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past. This is the bit, you're at it. That they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Powerful, isn't it? These scriptures are not preached anymore. This is, this is part of your adversary, the flesh. Someone once said, say the whole world was to get saved this morning. And let's say, for instance, the devil dropped down dead you would still have an enemy called the flesh. When you look in that mirror this morning and you see yourself, you see the flesh becomes an enemy. Say praise the Lord. That's some par- that is a powerful scripture, isn't it? They shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. That's why this enemy has to be defeated. Stay with me. But the fruit of the Spirit, here's why you want to be an overcomer. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, and peace. There's not a child of God looking at me now that doesn't want this. No matter what state your life is in at this minute in time, in your heart of hearts, this is what you want. But you've maybe been overtaken by the world and the things of the world, or you might have been overtaken by the flesh. A many a child of God like you has had the same thing happening to them. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of fain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. These are powerful scriptures, aren't they? They say an awful lot more than the pastor is trying to say. In fact, if I'm doing anything, I'm holding back here. Because this is what your adversary, your threefold adversary is trying to do to 
to destroy you. Number three, 1 Peter 5 and 8. The third part is the devil. 1 Peter 5 and 8 says, Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. I don't want to dwell on this too much, but the devil's not out to hurt you. <laughs> Did you know that? He's out to, to destroy you. And the illustration is powerful. It says he goes about, walks about, not in a hurry. Just walking about the place. See who I can get the hold of here. That one's being tempted of the world. Look at him out in Thessalonica. She's been praying, playing loose with the flesh. I'll wait till she gets in a little bit deeper. And then I'll get her. And like that lion that prowls about, you watch those wildebeest as they all roam and there's so many of them. And you see the lion just walking about. And of course you always see the one with a limp. The one with a limp should have been in the middle of the Middle of the herd, by the way. They would have carried it along and protected it. And some of you need to be in the middle of people that will protect you and look after you. But foolishly, they maybe walk out and have we look at the lights of the world. Or be tempted by the flesh. And they walk out and out of land. I don't know if you've ever seen it. I hear it. You see the land running and you see the wee thing running for its life. And then the big paw goes up, grabs it. Expert hunters pulls it down and then goes for the neck. You see the wee thing kicking and then all of a sudden there's no life in it again. Why do you think he's given the illustration of the devil as a roaring lion? Because that's what he wants to do. That's what he wanted to do to Benaiah. This made him valiant man. This made him man of valor. One of David's chosen men. He wanted to destroy him. Now watch this. Say praise the Lord. Are you still with me? See, when you look at these things, brothers and sisters, sometimes you feel we're no match for all this. The world. Wow. This flesh that cries out so strongly, that gives in so quickly. And this devil who tempts me. And I always feel him walking round about me. Do you worry about him, Pastor? Don't even give him a thought. See, when you get the victory, you get the victory. Do you give the world a thought, Pastor? The world has nothing on it for me. I can say that. The love of the world I lost the day I came to Jesus Christ. I wanted the fruit of the Spirit. Do you get tempted? Of course I do. But I was facing this roaring lion. You ready for this? In a pit. 
witnesses. He was facing this lion who's capable of pulling down one of those big wilder beasts and devouring it. And Benaiah was down in this pit. Why does God allow his children to go into a pit with a lamb? Boy, you caught the atmosphere with a knife here. Why did God allow that to happen in my life, Pastor? Why this pit? Why not open terrain? Give us a chance here. Oh God, give us a chance. Of all places that you're allowing this land, the attack me, it's in this pit. Nobody has a pit like my pit. Nobody has ever went through what I'm going through. Nobody has ever felt what I have felt. What's your pet? Every one of you has got one. Where is your pet? Dare I go here? Who is your pet? Benaiah has to fight his lion. Where is your pit? Is it the place where you work? If I could get another job, Pastor. Yeah, sometimes it's better to get another job. I'm going to be real here because some of the jobs that we find ourselves in, I've told you this, of a brother-in-law of mine, Dennis, out in Canada. They emigrated and he went and he got a job in a hospital. He had to walk for 20 minutes, get a bus, get off the bus, get onto a train, get off the train and walk for another 20 minutes to get to work. He left every morning at half past five to go to work. He didn't start the nine, but he got in early before everybody and he used to sit and read. And I remember I said to him, what do you think? He says, I hate the place. He retired out of it 30 odd years later. There's no saying better the devil you know, not necessarily. He says, why did you knock it out? He says, oh, stuck in a rut of his own making. But a pet, brothers and sisters, if that place where you work is where God has placed you, no matter what comes up against you, he'll give you the grace to overcome that adversary in that job. Pastor, it's where I live. See if I could get out of that neighborhood. I love the Lord, Pastor. And I'm trying to bring up my children the best that I possibly can. We're living, we're living in this area, the poverty, the sin, the drinks, the drugs, all the rest of it. Some pit pastor, if I could get out of this pit and I could find a wee house in the country, and grow daffodils and have a wee garden, I could defeat my land in that pit. By the way, I know people who live in places like that and their land's just as big as yours. Has ever occurred to you that 
perhaps that's where God has placed you. He's going to kill me here, but when I was talking to Junior yesterday in the car, after everything happened while we were driving out, I stopped the farm and I says, I want to say something to you. I says, Junior, I says, see if you get right with God, you and me will empty belly kill for the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what I said, I says, because I believe you're like a key that will open up many doors for many people. And he says, don't be saying that to me, Pastor. I says, why? He says, another pastor said that to me the other week. He saw me out walking in the field and he walked over to me and he says, I want to say something, he says. He says, you could be like a key in that place up there full of drink, full of drugs, immorality, all sorts. By the way, a light always shines the brightest in the darkest of places. Everybody said. It's the school that I go to, Pastor. If my mum and dad would just take me out of that school and put me into another school, I could be stronger there. But the school that I'm in, I have to run with a crowd and I have to be like them. No, you don't. No, you don't. You can stand out in that crowd, in that school. You ready for this? My pet It's the people that I live with, Pastor. I'll hide behind here to get a drink. It's him. It's her. And then when you meet them, they're hand in hand. He's a Greek god. Well, he was a Greek god when I married him. Until I married him. Done everything right on Telemaridum. Should done everything right on Telemaridum. And then I woke up, I don't know if it was in week one, week two, week three, week four, but this person walked past me and I went, Who's that? All the married people say it. Young people, take a lesson. The person you go with is not the person you marry. I can assure you that. They're bluffing. They're on their best behavior. I'm going to get stoned here, am I? (laughs) According to some people, TCF is a place to come if you want to get stoned. I have had some people in here who have been stoned in their life, but they're not stoned anymore. Hallelujah. In fact, I'll throw this in. I got a phone call two days ago from someone, and this is what she says, Pastor, would you forgive me? You were right. I was waffling. I was doing it my way. And am I sorry? I wish I'd have listened. But now I'm going to do it Jesus' way. And I says, thank you, Lord. And I was away early this morning praying for her. In fact, she rang me this morning. It's 7 o'clock. What's your pet? Who's your pet? Where's your pet? Benaiah had a pet. And in that pet was the devil himself. In that pet was this roaring lion seeking to defy him. 
I'm closing. Why, Pastor? Why does God put me in this pit? And this is this last point is for somebody in this room. Not only has he put me in this pit, but it's a snowy day. Cold. And I don't feel like fighting. I'm dying. Why does God put Benaiah in a pit with a lion on a snowy day? What are you saying, Pastor? Why has the Lord allowed all these things to come against him? Why does the land always attack me, Pastor, when I'm on my own, cold, shivering, and afraid? Why does God allow it, Pastor? You ready for this? so that you can prove that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. How can an alcoholic, how can a drug addict, how can somebody who has run from one a moral relationship to another one. All of a sudden, get the victory. Never to drink again. Never to take another drug again. Never to get into bed again. I'm cleaning that up children here and all of a sudden out of the bar into the choir out of the muck and the dirt of an old pit and all of a sudden They're fine, dressed in the right minds, sitting at Jesus' feet. Let me close with this. Say praise the Lord. The world the flesh and the devil. No matter what you're fighting, and every one of you is looking at me are fighting something. No matter what you're fighting, you can defeat it because greater, child of God, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. In Philippians 4.13, the scripture says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. I don't care if it's the world, I don't care if it's the flesh, and I don't care if if it is the devil. Hear me. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. There is nothing too difficult for him. It may feel too difficult for you, but it's not too difficult for him. Ephesians 3 and 20 says, Now on to him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. You ready for this? 
according to the power that worketh in us. 1 John 4 says, You are my, ye are of God, my little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. What have you to overcome? I'll tell you what you have got to overcome. That which is overcoming you. That's what you've got to overcome. I was out walking the other day. You'll not know who this is. I rang a man. I've been praying for him. And the Lord spoke to me. By the way, these wee things are all starting again. Thank God. And they're real. God says, ring him and tell him. He never needs to fall again. I will give him the strength to stand. How does he stand? In his strength. How does he overcome? By his spirit that is in him. Has it ever occurred to you, child of God, that you can get the victory? Has it ever occurred to you that God Almighty is able to make you walk, to make you stand, to make you an overcomer, to take the love of the world out of you, to help you to destroy that flesh that is destroying you, and give you all power over the wiles and the schemes of the devil. He can do it. May God take this word this morning and bless it to every one of your hearts. There's people listening to me. Receive this word in faith this morning and stand upon it. And let God, whatever time you've left, give it to God. With his strength, you will be an overcomer. In his strength, you will be a light like never before. In his strength, you can defeat the enemy of your soul. Would you bow your heads in a word of prayer? Hallelujah.